Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. To the latest and lastest Masters of Carpentry. Mostly. Mostly. And possibly. I am your host, Alex, or a host, I should say. And joining me, as always, is Noel. An a-hole, you could say. An (laughs) (laughs) a-hole. And we also have a very special guest, who is Evie, who has been on the program before. Yay! I'm so special. Those who don't remember, Evie was my old host on I Hate Love Remakes. What was the last one we had you on for? We had you on for Memoirs of Invisible Man mm-hmm. and then Silent Predators, right? Yes, that was... Oh, God, the one with the, the snakes. snakes. The snakes. It's easy to forget. Oh, my God. They blocked that one out. Like, oh, wow. It's all coming back to me in waves. So, again, we only have you on for the best. Obviously. Saving it all for you. <laughs> What's interesting is I Hate Love Remakes we did for four years, and Alex, we are now two months away from having been recording this show for four years. There you go. You've got a time limit. You've got an egg timer in your soul. (laughs) So one of these days I might make a five-year podcast, but not yet. Madness, sir. Madness. (laughs) And again, this is the last of John Carpenter's films for now. I mean, he's still alive. Yeah. He's still around. This is kind of the end of the show, but kind of not. Yeah. Because if John makes another movie, Alex, you and I will be back. Mm -hmm. If they make another Halloween film, I will hopefully have you back. I think there's one coming out, isn't there? Yes, and it's not by Rob Zombie. Yeah. We will still have other things to do down the road, and I'm still doing the Long Box Carpentry spinoff series with JD, because we still have all those recent comics to cover, like Asylum and Escape from New York, Big Trouble in China. Mm-hmm. And I still have all those unproduced episodes I need to do for Genocrypha. So we still have more content coming, but this is the end of the road for at least John Carpenter's film career at the moment. Mm-hmm. And what a note to end it on with The Ward. Indeed. So now, had either of you seen The Ward before? I did. I hadn't, but I had heard of it. This is one where I've kind of intentionally been holding off on watching it for the first time for the purposes of this project. Mm -hmm. Because it had only been out for three years when we started this, and I hadn't seen it. And I'm like, I'm going to wait. And Alex, what's the story behind you seeing it? I knew who John Carpenter was, finally. (laughs) (laughs) By 2010, yeah. By 2010, yes. I knew about him before that because of my thing obsession. Yeah, it was a John Carpenter film. It had come out. I had friends that like horror movies. We watched the horror movie and ate takeout. End of story. Yeah, there's not much else to say. And, you know, usually I don't get much into the release until later at the end of the episode, but... I don't really have much information on the release of this film because it was never released in theaters in the U.S. It was released on video, though, right? Well, it was one of those films where it debuted video on demand. Video on demand? Okay, because I, at the time, I'm not admitting to anything, but my friend might have gotten a bootleg. Might have, allegedly. I mean, it's come out on home video since, but yeah, it never debuted in theaters in the U.S. It debuted at the Toronto Film Festival on September 13th of 2010. For the Midnight Madness thing or whatever they do, I would assume. Probably. And then it just kept touring around to various festivals for nine months, as well as opening overseas in a number of other countries. And overseas, it grossed $1.2 million, and that's it. It wasn't until June 8th, 2011 that it was released through video on demand, like pay-per-view and the Comcast on-demand services and all that. Oh, weird. So in the U.S., you were kind of shit out of luck to go see it in a theater unless you went to a couple of different film festivals. Take that, jerks. So John's last movie never even got out in theaters. (sighs) Poor Johnny. I can't find much personal information about where his life was, because this was, I want to say, three years after the second Masters of Horror episode. Mm. But this was just an entirely for hire production. It was an original script by the brothers Michael and Sean Rasmussen, who had previously written a thriller called Long Distance, and following the ward, went on to write and direct a couple of indie horror films, Dark Feed and The Inhabitants. 
both of which are basically just people in abandoned hospitals with a ghost and shower sequences. <laughs> Not too much of a stray from what we see here. There are four producers on the film, but surprisingly, not included among them is Sandy King, John's wife and longtime producing partner, and this was not produced through their company, Storm King Productions. John did not do the score. It seems like it was just mostly an outside affair, and I, like, I have a whole bunch of credits for all the producers, but it's not really worth mentioning because none of them worked with John before or again. Just a bunch of producers who do a bunch of random stuff. Mm -hmm. Like among them, we've got like Rambo Four, Nebraska, The Highwayman, The Extreme Adventures of Super Dave, oh. Midnight Meat Train, Adam Green's Frozen. Midnight Meat Train. <laughs> the only tie is Peter Block, who produced at least part of the series Fear itself, the season three of Masters of Horror, but never worked on the original Masters of Horror. So I had always been under the impression that this came out of Masters of Horror, but no one really from Masters of Horror is involved with this. None of the producers, none of the writers. Hmm. We do have a couple of returning names. Editor Patrick McMahon did work with John on both of his Masters of Horror episodes, so he's the only crew member who came back. I think John just really enjoyed working with him. Howard Berger and Greg Nicotero are back doing makeup effects through K&B. And this sees the return of a pretty major collaborator. And no, it is not the boom operator. Mm -hmm. This is the return of Jeff Amata, who was John's regular stunt coordinator since way back on Big Trouble in Little China, all the way up through Ghosts of Mars. And he was also the second unit director of Village of the Damned and Vampires. So one of John's old crew members came back. Nice. It's nice to have that little tie. There you go, yeah. Otherwise, it seems like it was an entire for hire, hey, we have a thing ready to go, John, you want to come in and do it type deal. I don't know much else about the production of it. The commentary by John, he does seem like he really enjoyed working on it, really enjoyed working with all the people, but doesn't get much into the history behind it. And I will say, the DVD, it's a commentary with John Carpenter and Jared Harris. <laughs> wow. <laughs> They are having fun together. Half of it is just John interviewing Jared about his career in life. Amazing. Randomly, at some point, they just start talking about the Assault on Precinct 13 remake. Oh, really? <laughs> With John just straight up going, I liked it. It was a good cast, good take on the concept. It was nice. It was a good film. <laughs> Aw, that's so sweet. <laughs> so suck it, fanboys who decry remakes. <laughs> I did not care for it, but I still think that's sweet of him. Yeah. Agreed. They also just talked a lot about the hotel that they stayed in because there was a really nice bar nearby. <laughs> I don't think it was until this commentary. I never knew that Jared Harris was the son of Richard Harris. I <laughs> you didn't? So, oh, no. There you go, yeah. I did not. I didn't either. Damn. I did. It was a fun commentary. It was kind of a nice throwback to the old John Carpenter commentaries where it's like, who cares? There's a movie playing. Let's just talk about other stuff. <laughs> I would listen to that. But otherwise, yeah, there were no other behind the scenes, no interviews with anyone else involved, no deleted scenes. There was like nothing else on the DVD but that one commentary. That was it. Yeah, I don't think there was much to this film. They hired and they made it. It never got released. There you go. Such is life. In the mid-60s, a young woman named Kristen is incarcerated into a mental institution when police find her burning down a farmhouse despite having no memory of who she is. Kristen is set up in a ward overseen by Dr. Gerald Stringer, with murmurs among staff and patients that he's trying to cure them with a new experimental technique. Alongside Kristen on the ward are the infantile Zoe, the pompous Sarah, the manic Emily, and Iris, an artist who hopes she's about to be released. When Iris goes missing with her room cleared and her name board wiped clean, Kristen begins digging into other girls who have disappeared while also attempting to escape, both of which lead to violent clashes with Nurse Lunt and Orderly Roy. It also seems that one of the missing girls is still around as a cadaverous specter attacking the girls one by one. As they keep getting cut down, the other girls finally reveal how they killed their fellow patient Alice because they couldn't stand to continue being subjected to her abusive behavior. The fight comes down to Alice and Kristen as they tear at each other through the hospital corridors before a confrontation with Dr. Stringer reveals the truth. Kristen is Alice! As a girl, Alice was kidnapped and held captive for months in the basement of that burned-down farmhouse, and the trauma she suffered led to a fracturing of her personality. The original persona, Alice, had been overwhelmed by the others, but it also created a protector figure in the form of Kristen, who's risen into dominance as the other personalities have been killed off. Attacked once again by Alice, the two fly out a window, landing as a whole and seemingly cured Alice on the ground. Dr. Stringer deems his work a success and readies Alice to be reunited with her parents, only for the personality of Kristen to spring out and attack her. 
Alex, do you recommend John Carpenter's The Ward? I do. Yes, I do. I enjoyed it. I don't think it's going to change your life. I think there's a lot of tonal changes in it that kind of throws off the balance a few times and a few logic problems that more or less sort of get solved at the end, but sometimes not. There's a bit of inconsistencies with the ghoul. Uh, <laughs> but other than that, it's well shot. It's got atmosphere, which I haven't seen in a while. It's good. Everyone's acting their little hearts out. We've got a good cast. Amber Heard, Meryl Streep's daughter. I give it a thumbs up. Evie, do you recommend the ward? I want to, but I can't. Mostly not because it wasn't fun. It's just I couldn't on any kind of level connect to any of the characters. And I don't know if that's just me or if that might be the movie. Like, I don't feel like any of them are complete characters. They're ideas of characters that haven't been fully fleshed out. Mm -hmm. But that being said, if anyone can raise Alfred Hitchcock from the dead and get him and Amber Heard together, because she's the ultimate Hitchcock blonde. I was actually thinking that, that she was perfect as that icy blonde, yeah. Yeah. I just don't know that I want to subject her to Alfred. No, no, no. Especially after all she's gone through with Johnny. Yeah. Well, someone will be there with a shock collar to keep him in check. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I just advocated for that. Alfred Hitchcock with a shock collar. Good evening. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's my recommendation. I mostly do recommend it too. I mean, it's one of those kind of midline movies. It has its problems. I agree the characters are thin. I know that narratively there's a reason for why the characters are thin, but it doesn't change the fact that the characters are thin. You can argue the logic of the whole climactic reveal all you want. I still think it's a fun <laughs> twist. I enjoyed it in Identity. I enjoy it here. <laughs> I think the cast is great. I think it's actually a really well made technically. You know, the way that it's shot and edited. Despite not doing the score, I think the score is really good. I think there's an energy to it. There's a sharpness to it that we haven't seen John have in a while. We glimpsed it with cigarette burns, but I don't think we've seen John directing on this level since Gas Station. That said, I think the script is still a bit weak. I mean, it's not a badly put together story. It's just the detailing, I think, needed another draft. You know, the dialogue, the mm -hmm. characterizations. It needed one more good polish, especially the actual ending ending. Needed a little more work. And the Alice Ghoul, again, narratively, it makes sense why it is the way it is. But it's not that scary. It's just a little bit goofy. Mm -hmm. But there's still a lot of good suspense, genuine suspense in the film. When it's an inmate clashing with the keepers of the asylum, it's a really good suspense movie. Oh, yeah. As a horror movie. Eh. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's a terrible movie to end a career on. It's not the best movie he could have ended his career on, but I don't mm -hmm. think it's a terrible one. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to recommend it. So why don't we just go ahead and jump to that whole ending where they're all parts of a fractured personality. Well, it makes you want to rewatch it to see how they are or aren't interacting with the environment. Julia was pointing out she knew something was up the minute Amber Heard collapses in the shower and they just stand there watching from the sidelines, not doing anything, while the nurse has to come in. So I found that interesting. But Evie's definitely on the money. That Even thematically, they're not whole characters because mm -hmm. obviously they're figments of her psyche. But yeah, no one's really bringing anything like, well, I don't even know, like one of them's angry, one of them's kind of like one that pushes buttons and one of them is a baby. <laughs> but yeah, they're not really fully, like she could have talked to any one of them at any point and still gotten the same emotional resonance. I think the only one that really stood out for me was Meryl Streep's daughter, who's the one who like painted her lips and everything. Mm -hmm. But I think that's just because she was operating at a slightly higher level than a lot of the other actors. Yeah, Mamie Gummer was definitely bringing, mm -hmm. yeah. she was shooting for left field, yeah. Yeah. You know what, actually, I noticed in that shower scene all of a sudden they seem to kind of appear in the background almost. Yeah. And that was a really cool effect that is kind of telling when you rewatch it. It was interesting because I did also read the script to this. The script, as we got the reveal, actually did have bits where you would replay past elements of the film showing what it was like where all of that's coming through one person. John did shoot that but decided to cut it because he's like, 
I would rather just leave people with that stuck in their heads trying to imagine it for themselves than try to actually show it to them. Because mm-hmm. you had that bit there where the parents are sitting there watching a film of their daughter. And we were originally supposed to see what was on the film, but I think it actually plays really well of trying to imagine this entire film being one person. Yeah, that's true. When I think back on it only, like, certain things are great. Like, you always see them sort of, like, hovering or together sort of in the background. Like, mm-hmm. the best shot in the movie is when they're standing there with all these slats of light coming through the blinds. That was one of the better shots. But then sometimes so I think back to it and I'm like, why are we with their point of view then? Why are we following these characters? I guess it is part of their psyche. But at one point, the doctor has, quote unquote, the baby and she disappears and he's like, find her. And I'm like, so is that... Alice disappearing, or what's going on? The real person actually did get loose from his office. I see. Okay. You have the bits where, like, the Daniel Panabaker character wanders off on her own and is then attacked and killed by Alice. You'll notice that whenever Alice kills someone, she's taking them down into, like, nightmare rooms, like Mm -hmm. the nightmare lobotomy room, the nightmare electroshock room, you know? They're not really going off into the hospital on their own. They're descending into like a nightmare version of an area of the hospital. That's true. And that's when it started to get a little too, are you ready for Freddy? With the little (laughs) whimsical torture things that she's doing to them. Yeah, and that's where I was thrown at first, where I think the kills are decently executed, especially the lobotomy one. It shot very much like some of the kills that John did when he did the reshoots in Halloween 2 and some of the stuff in Prince of Darkness. It's very crisply, very cleanly put together. But the whole concept of it was just a little weird of a ghost who will just like wheel someone into a room and shove something in their eye. It makes sense later when you realize there is no ghost. Yeah. Yeah. This is a damaged personality trying to reassert itself. Mm -hmm. It's still doing it in a kind of awkwardly done way. Evie, what did you think of the whole corpse makeup of Alice? It was an interesting way to go, and I'm sure someone worked very hard on that. (laughs) (laughs) I'm being so nice. (laughs) Gold stars, gold stars. Yeah, Yeah, that's why I call her a ghoul instead of a ghost, because I'm just like, I don't know what this person (laughs) is. Yeah, because we have a very clear idea of what we think of as ghosts. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of, has anyone seen The Covenant, that movie that Rennie Harlan did? The one with the male coven of witches, of warlocks? Yeah. I know it by reputation. It kind of reminds me of when they would have darklings in that movie. And they never explain what darklings are either. But Mm -hmm. that's kind of what it reminds me of. Well, they're fractured elements of their personalities trying to (laughs) know. It's still like the shades of Japanese horror was such huge influence on American horror around this time. So there's still kind of like elements of that. But there's also elements of like, she looks like a creature in the Black Lagoon almost sometimes. Mm-hmm. Well, it has that K&B thing that I've always had an issue with where it looks like a Halloween mask. It does. It looks like Thriller. <laughs> it looks like Michael Jackson Thriller. Yeah. <laughs> it's trying so hard to be scary and ghoulish that it's just kind of like, yeah, I'll buy you for three ninety nine at Target. Yeah. But then I don't mind it because in the end it just turns into a wrestling match anyway. So I'm like, oh, okay, so this is now Evil Dead thing, so I can buy that a bit more. Well, and then that's interesting is John asserted that he never found ghosts scary in movies unless they were an actual physical threat. So that's when they decided, well, let's have them wrestle. <laughs> <laughs> It's like the fog. (laughs) It's interesting. I almost wonder what it would have been like had they gone for more of like a devil's backbone where you can still visibly recognize the actress, but, you know, pale skin, dark eyes, all that type of stuff. There's so much of a build to revealing that this is all Alice, and yet we've never really gotten to know Alice and that actor playing Alice. Because every time we see her, it's the ghoul makeup. Mm -hmm. And I think something that would have been easier to recognize as that actress would have helped build up to that climactic reveal. Yeah, like slowly become a ghoul. Not even become a ghoul, but just, you know, a ghostly version of Alice. Yeah, Yeah, that's true. There are elements of the ghost thing that I think are filmed well, but I just think the ghost itself looks kind of silly. Agreed. Not like destroys the movie silly, but eh. Yep, for sure. Yeah. And then with the whole asserting of the personality, then they literally in the audio commentary say it's the Carrie ending where Kristen leaps out of the mirror at Alice. Uh That's where apparently there were like multiple endings, but they don't detail any of them. They're not on the DVD. Uh The script just had it that Alice looks into a mirror and the reflection looking back at her is Kristen. But it's not like in a scary way. It's Kristen is the one that ultimately came out as the dominant personality. 
That I would have loved as an ending, actually. Yeah, I would have preferred that as well, especially since after they established her as like a trauma survivor and God knows what happened to her in that barn. I'm just like, at that point, I, I don't want to see another jump scare because usually yeah. jump scares at the end are for people who are like kind of not good. But this person, at the, I'm just like, no, yeah, you can do yeah. that. She's the survivor is the dominant personality. That's kind of thematically cool. But I don't want... And jump scares are sometimes a little cheesy. From this comedian I heard, they're called water on the face ghosts. Because <laughs> that's what happens when you look in the mirror. <laughs> yeah. Especially in that it's a horror movie that has surprisingly a happy ending. And no one actually died throughout the entire movie. Mm -hmm. Which I kind of love as well. And then I go for the jump scare. This just like quickly came to the mind of what I would have really liked to see at the ending. What if it's Alice packing up her things at the hospital and she puts on that record again that everyone danced to? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as she's dancing to it, the other girls come into the scene and are dancing with her and she's whole again, but they're all still part of her. They're all still with her. You know, and we just end on that scene of them all dancing. I just think that would have been also a great callback to that earlier scene where they were all dancing. Yeah, for yeah. sure. There's not really a poignant bone in this movie's body, though. Ah, uh, it just felt like a real missed opportunity. Mm -hmm. Technically, it's a movie about a fractured person becoming whole again. And I think instead of, oh no, this character who was our hero figure is going to be the new monster who's attacking her, which makes no mm -hmm. sense. Or even if it's just Alice looks in the mirror and Kristen is standing there with her. Mm -hmm. That would mm -hmm. be cool. You know, Kristen is still part of her, is still present. They don't need to destroy each other. Mm -hmm. There need to be something better than a jump scare. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't we just start breaking down the cast and let's just talk about Amber Heard as Kristen. She's got it. She's got that thing. It's not just the look. She's got the intensity. She's got the drive. She's got the range. You can tell that she's going places. Basically what he said. Honestly, there's still a lot of her work I haven't seen, but I first saw her on the TV series Hidden Palms, which I absolutely loved and was blown away by her. And, and I think she is sadly kind of falling victim to that thing that happens where certain actresses are so beautiful that people underestimate them mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that can hurt their careers. And that's unfortunate and shouldn't happen because everything that I've seen her in, she is fantastic. And here, this is a great tour de force of not only the emotion of the character, the drive of the character the conflicts of the character but the physicality of the character she is just full i mean that opening scene where the police are arresting her and she's like kicking the door shut oh god yeah i want to see amber heard headline an action movie i want to see her go the route that charlie's theron has gone i was thinking that exactly that, yeah i was thinking the same thing yeah the atomic yeah. blonde route yeah not be the next one. I want Amber Heard to be Amber Heard, but I want to see her go somewhere bigger. And I think I've already the whole relationship woes with Johnny Depp have made her a whole tabloid thing, which mm -hmm. is a pain in the ass for anyone to have to go through. There's been so much that's overlooking the fact she's a really damn talented actress. She is. And a really captivating lead. And I want to see her become a bigger headline star than she has been. The ward is a great thing just to show Amber Heard. Yeah. I was also impressed that other than the shower scene, which lingered a little bit, there's not that much that I would call exploitative in this movie. And even the shower scene had this kind of odd eeriness to it. I like the music playing under it, the way there's just the kind of drifting editing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And again, there's no nudity in the shower scene, but it's interesting how John made a film about women, which he's done before, but it's interesting kind of almost as a contrast to like The Thing, which is a movie all about dudes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm a dude, so I miss things, but it didn't feel too exploitative to me. There was a little bit... No, no, they didn't even have a sleazy orderly. He was an asshole, but... <laughs> he was professional. He was just a professional who's been at it long enough that he's kind of burned out. <laughs> there was no Terminator 2 scenes, let's just say that. Yes. It didn't feel particularly exploitative to me, is what I'll say. I think there was a few moments with the orderly where I'm like, he was tiptoeing to the edge of impropriety, mm. but he never actually went over. And yeah, there was no scene where I felt it was like male gazy or anything like that. It wasn't like right. spring breakers. Right. In the opening, she's running around in a nightgown. There's the bit where she's stripped down at the hospital, but those never feel exploitative. They feel very just kind of matter of fact. Mm. Exactly. Yeah. Even the shower scene, there's this odd kind of whimsy fairy tale quality aspect to it. Mm -hmm. Again, the music, that lullaby sound that they had that la 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 yeah the mm -hmm. rosemary's baby kind of thing i really liked how that was used 
It was interesting just kind of thinking back on this feels like a movie made by the guy who made Someone's Watching Me 30 years earlier. Mm -hmm. It feels like a thriller. Yeah. And it made me think back of I can't really think of all that much actual nudity and exploitation that we've had in John Carpenter movies. We had the one topless bit in Halloween, which you can barely see because it's mostly edged out of frame. Mm -hmm. The one end shot of They Live, which is played as a joke. You know, the what's the matter, baby? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's true. But otherwise, John's kind of always shied away from nudity. He's kind of shied away from the male gaze aspect. It's interesting. For a guy who kind of gets pegged in with a lot of exploitation genre filmmakers, that's not an aspect that he's really exploited. He definitely, I feel, based on his body of work, respects him. It felt like an older John Carpenter movie. It did. This felt like something that he would have made around that late 70s era. Why don't we jump to Mamie Gummer as Emily, Meryl Streep's daughter. She was great. She was bringing the manic intensity. She was making choices. I feel like a lot of the weirder things that she was doing were her decisions. I think that they were done on the fly. They felt spontaneous anyways. I wanted her to stick around throughout the whole movie. Yeah, it was interesting reading the script where word for word all of her dialogue is the same as the script, but a large part of the persona. I think they did have the one line of, she comes in with a giant smile painted on her face. <laughs> but otherwise, everything <laughs> else, that's her bringing it. I got this Harley Quinn kind of vibe from her. Mm -hmm. I can see that. And I kind of loved it. But like, I've seen her in other stuff. So I'm like coming from the point of view of someone who's biasly a fan of her already. I have nothing. I liked her. <laughs> <laughs> I have nothing. I only remember her from Ricky and the Flash. That's the only other thing I remember seeing her in. I don't think I've seen her in anything else. I mean, like I've known of her for a while because I've heard other people praise her. But I actually think it was this film when it came out was the first time I had heard of her. Hmm. But this is the first time I've actually seen her. That was a great performance. Again, it's a great showcase as an actor. I think, honestly, the two actors who are best showcased in this are Amber Heard and Mamie Gum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then we get into the other girls. There's Lindsay Fonseca as Iris, the artist. Mm -hmm. She's definitely an actress I've seen in a lot of stuff. Julia's worked with her. Oh, really? Nikita. Ooh, okay. Mm. It's interesting having a character who's like trying to put on the airs of I'm cured, I'm well now, they're about to let me go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> For sure. But I think, again, she's a character who she seems like the one that Kirsten's going to bond with the most, but then she's gone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then Daniel Pennebaker is Sarah. I know her from Sky High and Flash. It was kind of a surprise that she was in this because I've seen Daniel Pennebaker in a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. She was one of those Disney actresses coming up for a while. So having watched a lot of Disney, I've seen a lot of her work. And I know her character is supposed to be there is that bit at the end there where you do see the list of the personalities and there's the baby, the crazy, the artist, the princess, and she's the princess where she's kind of the snob who you know, is very much focused on her appearance and everything. I mean, I guess, but she was more seductive. I mean, I would have just gone with just like a seductress. Felt a little more like the ego. Yeah, that would work too. This is where we're kind of getting into the characters are a bit one dimensional, which makes mm. sense when you're thinking that they are various aspects of a single personality. Because that is the thing about multiple personality disorder is it is a fracturing of a single personality into pieces. They're not forming holes themselves. And that's why a lot of people with multiple personality, they keep jumping around personality as their mind is shifting. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, that kind of works on a technical level, but on the other, it does make them very thin characters, and you're kind of just yeah. relying on the actors to captivate. They still have to be watchable, yeah. I will say, though, we mentioned the orderly Roy, played by D.R. Anderson, who I don't know I've seen him in anything else, but he was really good performance here. I did like that one fun scene with Sarah and him where she's hitting on him, and he has zero interest. <laughs> And that's where, again, you know, typically the orderly would have this kind of sexual air about them, the predatory air. And I like that this flat out says, and if you even mentally picture that that's Alice, that all of these people are, are the same person mm -hmm. that he's talking to, he's not going there. He has no interest in going there, no desire to go there. And it's probably routine at this point. I'm sure she's, as that personality, made advances before. I liked it as a change of pace from where films usually go. Yeah. No, for sure, because everything from, like, movies to Orange is the New Black, the orderlies always are no good. Yeah, I'm not totally defending Roy because, yeah, he's an asshole with an overly firm hand. Yeah, he abuses his power. Well, but even then, a large part of what he's doing is he's dealing with people who probably punch him every day. And he has to be strong and firm in order to physically restrain people who are flailing about. That's true. He's not the nicest person. No. Neither is Nurse Lunt. But they're in a job where that doesn't really breed niceness. It breeds, you have to do what gets the job done. That's true. 
I even love that bit where she smashes him in the face with the flashlight and they run off and he's still conscious and running after them. And so they get in the elevator and go downstairs, but he's run all the way down the stairs and intercepts them. <laughs> it's like, that's such a real moment. Mm -hmm. And again, these are people who are doing their jobs. They're not doing it as well as they could be. And again, that's why I kind of like that it was set in the 60s where standards were a lot lower. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but him and the nurse, they're at least understandable as to why they are the way they are. They're not cruel. They're just jerks. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they were fine. They didn't particularly stand out, but they were good. Yeah, and, and Nurse Lund, yeah, she's a typical Nurse Ratchet type. I love that they cast her purely based on her frown. I love that. <laughs> the interesting girl is, is Zoe, played by Laura Lee Claire. I get the idea of the infantile personality. I don't think the actress fully sold it, or at least she felt like an actress who's acting. Yeah, like she was doing baby talk instead of like deciding yeah. on an actual voice. It's just someone doing a baby voice. Yeah. In the script, it played a bit better because she had additional ticks. There was more about the penny in her mouth where she could only talk when she takes the penny out. Mm -hmm. Weird stuff like that. And never fully sold on the... I, I just think no one entirely clicked with the character. I don't think it's a bad character, but it's an odd character. It's definitely kind of stand out among the cast in terms of not fully clicking. Agreed. Evie, what did you think about Jared Harris as Dr. Stringer? Honestly, I think as a doctor, I'm like, can I have him as a doctor? <laughs> he seems like a good doctor. I may not be completely on board with his plan because it seems like it kind of went a bit pear-shaped. But as a doctor, he looks very doctory. This is why I'm not allowed to pick my own medical professionals. I'm like, sir, you look like a doctor. You may cure me now. It's Jerry Harris. I like him. He plays it very low key, but he does a good job. Yeah, I like that actor. I could watch him read the phone book. Yeah, he's got that nice understated quality where you don't know if he's a good guy or a bad guy. Yeah, for sure. And even at the end, you're still not entirely sold that he's good. But I like that when it all finally comes down to it, he does tell her the truth. Yeah, there are questionable aspects to his treatment in terms of the gaslighting and withholding information from the patient, the electroshock therapy. Granted, again, the 60s, that was common. Mm -hmm. I actually do know people even today who have had genuine benefits as a result of electroshock therapy. It's one of those things that was overly used, but it can still be effective when used properly. I don't know that that was entirely being used properly there. But it is interesting, though, that we never fully get into that. Was he actually trying to cause everyone to kill themselves? Or was that just kind of a side effect of him trying to sort out the personalities? That I don't know. And I don't think the movie knows either. <laughs> yeah. And that's where, again, maybe just one more draft of the script would have cleared things up a little better. But again, it's not a bad performance. Again, I like that he has that kind of friendliness as a doctor that, again, can be one of those red herrings of, oh, he's going to be bad, isn't he? This is all going to be awful. And it's not. And that's kind of refreshing. Agreed. So any other thoughts on the movie? Oh, dear. What's to think? Well, Alex, I mean, just overall, this is like our first Carpenter movie to not have a Carpenter score. Or did that stand out to you at all? Yeah, it did. It would, like I said, it sounded more like the Rosemary's Baby theme than usual. There was a lot of mood, and there was some good tension in this movie, but the soundtrack did not really add or detract from that. It was there just to kind of be like a little creepy. Yeah, I thought it was a score that fit. Yeah, it fits, but it's yeah. not really anything that... It wasn't driving anything. Well, I mean, to be fair, most of Carpenter's scores himself haven't. Mm -hmm. He had that handful of core great ones, but most of his scores have just been kind of, it's there. But sometimes they have a bit of a beat to it, like a dun, dun. Dad. And this one, I kind of liked that it had that, but as a melody. Mm -hmm. You know, it had the Rosemary's Baby. There's a little Daniel Elfman there, a little bit of Goblin. Yeah. But it was very quiet, very whimsical, very fairy tale esque. Which, in the end, fit it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When I was going into this movie, I'm like, oh, John didn't do the score. Oh, how's this going to turn out? And I was like, that's not bad. And I know even on the commentary, John is like, it came down to a point I just didn't have the time and energy to do it, and I really liked what he did. So There you go. Mm -hmm. I have to say also, kind of with those elements of the score, with various stylistic choices, I think setting aside Eyes of Laura Mars and elements of Halloween, I think this is the closest Carpenter's come to making a Giallo movie. I don't know if I'm familiar with Giallo, so I will take your word for it. 
Well, I'm just trying to think of anything else to bring up. Because, I mean, the thing is, it's not a very complicated movie. No, it isn't. The characterizations were so thin that I couldn't really say, like, this person's acting at a character or whatnot. The only time that really came up was when the baby jumped in the um, dumbwaiter before Amber Heard. And I'm like, she wouldn't do that. She's scared of everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I kind of like that we don't see her die. We just kind of get the aftermath of she's gone, there's blood, we saw the ghost in there with her. That's true, yeah, for sure. Again, yeah, the story's thin, the characters are thin, but they're not bad. Mm -hmm. They're a good framework. I just wish that they had built on the framework a little more before filming. Yeah. And even then, the actors are really building on that framework quite well. To make it, it's, yeah, they're not fascinatingly deep characters, but they're still good performances to watch. And for sure, for me, this was more of a mood piece than anything. Like, yeah. the dialogue wasn't super strong, the characters weren't super strong, but it was nice to see John in that thing zone. Where yeah. it's an isolated environment, we're ramping up the tension, we got some good shots, just pop some popcorn and enjoy. Yeah, that's where I was surprised, you know, we had our mixed feelings on the Masters of Horror episodes. We liked mm. cigarette burns, we didn't like pro-life. Evie, did you ever see the Masters of Horror episodes? I didn't see pro-life, but I did see cigarette burns, and I loved cigarette burns. You're not missing much with pro-life. <laughs> mm. Oh boy, that was a bad one. <laughs> mm. But yeah, it's the same editor who did both. I thought he did a really nice job of keeping everything moving. Everything had a really nice slick rhythm to it. None of the editing felt sloppy. And again, a cinematographer that John has never worked with before. I wouldn't say it's classic John. I mean, it doesn't have his colors. It doesn't have some of his composition. But it feels like John Carpenter in a way that John Carpenter movies haven't in a while. I agree. Can I change my not recommend to a recommend? You guys have talked me into it. I actually really like the movie. Damn it. You can do a soft recommend. You've done that plenty of times in the past. Yeah. Go for it. The Masters of Horror, even Cigarette Burns, while we enjoyed it, there wasn't really much about it that felt John Carpenter. It was really well put together. But this one, it feels like John Carpenter, the way it's cut, the way it's shot, the way mm -hmm. the music is used, which is striking given that he's working with an editor and cinematographer who aren't his usual people. He's not doing the music, and yet it still captures John. Mm -hmm. The word you can tell it's a craftsman who's got signatures. Yeah. For a guy this late in his career, when he's become this burned out and this cynical, and he's just doing this kind of for hire thing thrown together by people he's never worked with before, never even gets a theatrical release, critics stare into it, it really feels like he really put a lot of heart and energy into it. I agree. <laughs> Yeah, and I know in some of our last episodes, I was like, yeah, but we still have the ward, and everyone just kind of sad tromboned. But I was really surprised with it. Well, I remember liking it the first time, so I was hoping that it was going to hold up. It's not the sad end of the career we thought it would be. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a ray of hope. Again, I wouldn't put it in like the top five of Carpenter, but it's a good mid-range. I mean, it, God, it's better than almost everything he made in the 90s. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Just for having consistent mood. I mean, I'd at least put it on the same level as Body Bags and In the Mouth of Madness. Mm -hmm. So, and then one other thing I wanted to cover is the film that John was going to do right after The Ward. Now, The Ward premiered in September at the Toronto Film Festival in 2010. That same month, he was announced to become the director of Dark Child, which is based on the, not the Image Comics, the Maximum Press Comics. <laughs> this was published by Rob Liefeld. So yeah, you can find on YouTube, there is a special effects demonstration reel where it's basically a naked lady with a creepy hand sprouts wings. And it was done by Weta Workshops. The interesting thing is that test reel was done before John was involved and was used to shop around to hire a director. Now, have either of you read the Dark Child comic book series? No. No. Alex, do you remember any of the publicity from when it came out initially? No. Dark Child was one of those ones that Wizard Magazine was hugely promoting because, you know, Wizard loved the image era. <laughs> <laughs> Wizard was like just Lady Death and Witchblade all over the place. And Dark Child was the one they quickly latched onto because, again, it was very much that image era... She was kind of a different design for a character, but still the big boot blonde mm -hmm. in scantily clad clothing that is constantly being torn by her own superpowers. Mm -hmm. As like the comic, actually, I even get to it by like episode four. She's just straight up walking around topless. They just shade it over. Mm. <laughs> I actually read the entire original five issue mini series. Now, the thing about Dark Child is it debuted in 1986. It was the best selling comic when it came out. Wow. It outsold X-Men, it outsold Batman, it outsold all of the major things from the big two. 
for at least its first issue. Mm -hmm. One of the surprising things is it actually did draw a surprisingly large female readership given the way the comics industry was at the time. Having read it, I can kind of maybe see why, but it only ran for five issues. It was just a miniseries, and the creators brought it back a few times over the years. He did two, like, follow-up miniseries, a prequel series, and a crossover with Darkness, but Dark Child has otherwise not consistently run. It's only had, I want to say, like, 20 issues over the course of, say, it was 1996, so 21 years. So, like, an issue a year. Mm. Wow. <laughs> I read the initial miniseries, and it is an interesting setup. So it's a character named Ariel Child who suffers from very traumatic dreams involving lots of monsters and nightmarish creatures, and she develops the superpower where she can literally become a creature from her nightmare, like any creature from her nightmare. So she can become this whole myriad range of creatures. She's like Ben 10, hmm. but more extreme. But the kicker is that she doesn't realize that this nightmare that she's having is an actual demonic realm. And every time she becomes a creature from that nightmare, she also sets that creature loose in the real world. Hmm. And there's, of course, a sorcerer in the real world whose name is Cauldron with a K. Oh, Jesus. Of course. <laughs> Because 1996, yeah, who has a special Solomon's ring, which means that any demon that enters the real world instantly falls under his thrall. So he's trying to get her to keep transforming into demons so she'll keep releasing demons into his thrall so he can build an army of demons. And then, of course, the secret government agency comes in. Yeah, so it's very much an image comic. Mm -hmm. However, I think there's enough of that setup that you could make an interesting movie out of it. Mm -hmm. Her powers first manifest when her father tries to rape her. Ah, come on. Ah. And then she instantly turns into a dragon and torches him with fire breath. Okay. It's an odd thing. And I kind of understand why it was kind of popular among some women readers because Randy Green, the creator, actually does a decent job for as cheap and exploitational as the art is and as silly as the story is. A large part of the captions are really getting into her head really well and just dealing with a lot of thoughts about despair, anxiety, anger, frustration. Despite the fact that the comic is objectifying her, it's dealing with her anxiety about always being objectified because she's so pretty. It does actually really have a nice emotional arc to it. It really kind of fleshes her out as a character really well. It's still sloppy, but I can at least see why like people, especially when they were teenagers, would kind of click with it. Mm -hmm. It's not a good comic, though. And of course, the screen test, for absolutely no reason, the woman is completely topless as she's doing her transformation. Evie, what did you think of the whole effects reel? It was kind of cheeseball, but I'm just like, yeah. the way that they explain it sounded somewhat interesting. But then now when you're like telling me the whole thing, I'm like, oh, no, no. <laughs> also, the way that they spelled child, I was like, oh, my God. This is like, yes. And I knew it was from the 90s. So I'm like, that's so 90s. Like, just why? And again, it's a comic where the villain is Cauldron with a K. <laughs> As you do. Oh, and there's two demons named War and Peace. And Peace is the P-I-E piece. Uh. <laughs> I don't... <sighs> and then there's two other demons, Pestilence and Flatulence. Shouldn't it be Plague? You'd think. Mm. But they wanted to name one Flatulence. And yes, he has made the butt of jokes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Alex, what did you think of the whole the effects real presentation? I like Weta. They do good work. I really... It was a woman with her top off holding her arm in the woods. I really couldn't get much of a sense of it. 90s comics, I'm going to be honest, I read like three comics through the 90s. The Max, The Tick, and X-Men. Most 90s comics were written by a skateboard and a slice of pizza. <laughs> And they just were not for me. I did read a couple spawns. To the rat, Max. <laughs> but yeah, from the Y and the child to the sort of goth-like atmosphere to it, it, uh, I, it would not be something I would check out. The effects aren't bad, but it's like your entire selling point is it's a naked woman with a rubber arm, which is a very nicely sculpted arm, but it's just a rubber arm mm -hmm. who then sprouts two CGI wings. And that's it. That's the entirety of it. Yep. Yeah. And I even looked her up and she's actually a typical Weta performer who like played orcs in Lord of the Rings and all that stuff that they just kind of talked into taking her clothes off for the shoot. And it's like most of the comics, she's in a t-shirt and jeans. So it's like just have her in a t-shirt and jeans. 
I, again, I think you could have made an interesting movie out of it. If you just kind of strip it down to that basic things of she's a young woman, just very disconnected from people. She has a troubled home life. She's constantly plagued with these nightmares. That lack of sleep is affecting her just emotionally, energy wise. Who then finds this way to then become her nightmares. It's a kind of freeing thing. Even in the comics, it's just this kind of freeing thing of taking these things I'm terrified of, becoming them and cutting loose, mm -hmm. but not realizing that there's a consequence to that if you're actually breaking these things loose into reality. I think you could make a really interesting film out of it. Mm -hmm. I don't know that John at this point in his career would have been the best. I mean, if it's the John who made The Ward, I would be curious to see what he would make of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. God, especially if you got like Amber Heard to star, you know? Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's one of those comics that there's enough there that if you strip it down to its essentials, you have a really good framework that you could build off of. If you had just made a straight adaptation of the comic, it would have been a messy shit piece. And unfortunately, if the writer and artist of the comic, Randy Green, insisted on being the screenwriter. Oh, good. I don't have his script. I haven't read it. So the film never came about. I'm guessing it's because Dark Child was a huge release in 1996. By 2010, no one remembered Dark Child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think they were just banking on, hey, remember Witchblade? This was similar. <laughs> there are still news stories between 2010 and 2012 of them working on development, but it should also be remembered 2012 was when John suffered the detached retinas. Mm -hmm. And over the next two years, had to go through five operations. It significantly affected his ability to see. He pretty much retired from filmmaking. It was a project that came to him at the wrong time. Again, we en enjoyed the word for the most part, but critics didn't. They tore it no. apart. It was never able to get a theatrical release in the U.S., so it did not recoup its money. I can't even find out what the budget of it was, but I'm guessing it wasn't huge, but still, it made nothing. Mm -hmm. That did not help his career process, especially given the slump that he had had leading up to it. I can see why the film just never came together. Mm -hmm. Again, the reason I wanted to bring it up in this episode is there is that existing effects reel that we will link to in the show notes. So we have something we can at least look at. Unfortunately, it's not enough of a thing that I can do like a full John Ockerfa on it because all I have is that. But yeah, that was the film that almost happened. We've had issues with John Carpenter getting into modern day effects work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it's just been doing a lot of cheap stuff with K&B. It would have been interesting to see what John would have done with the backing of someone on the level of Weta behind him. Yeah, for sure. Right? Especially at that time when they were still riding on the high Lord of the Rings. Alas. What is that, juice? It's watered down juice. Why do we have juice? Who always had juice? Well. I want some juice. <laughs> you can share it with me. It's pretty big. <laughs> Oh, I've missed this. <laughs> I want some juice. <laughs> Blueberry pomegranate. Water it down. Mmm, good juice. Let's record. Okay. Hi, everybody. You two are so Hi. cute. Uh, Hello. She's one of my personalities, and she's come to the forefront of my psyche. I alone am best. <laughs> Julia, it's been a while. How you doing? Amazing. How are you guys? Fine. Awesome. How'd your talk go? Wartastic. Yeah? Yeah. We kind of have reached the end of our thoughts on Ward. What did you think of it? Well, I would say I spent about 30% of it on my phone, full disclosure. <laughs> <laughs> Twas ever thus. So, um, <laughs> but the 70% that I did watch, I actually thought it was not a bad. It's not that bad. Yeah. yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, I'm not giving it like a glowing review or anything, but I wanted to go on a positive note, and I am like a soft recommend. Not that bad. Thumbs up, but semi-weak thumbs up. You know what I think it would be good for? People who don't like scary movies. Because it's really not that scary. It is a no. good... It's suspenseful and atmospheric. Yeah, but, for sure. But it's got enough psychological, yeah, that kind of thing to it, where if someone was like a little bit of a chicken, yeah, it'd be a good one. That's pretty much where I'm at these days. It's one of those ones where it's trying to be scary, but it kind of successfully fails at it. <laughs> Yeah, because like a lot of, it felt very familiar. Like a lot of the shots were definitely like a John Carpenter-esque, like when she takes the thing to the eye. Oh, yeah. And then they yeah, do the close-up on the eye. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that looked like John Carpenter. Gross. And like a lot of the gore stuff looked definitely like him. And it was definitely like female-driven, complex characters, good dialogue. And the acting was really good, too. It was just kind of like a B-movie. Mm. <laughs> like an actual B-movie, if that makes sense. But like with production value. <laughs> it felt like a throwback to where he started his career. Definitely. 
definitely. I could definitely see that. Yeah, well, good. I'm, all four of us enjoyed the movie. I mean, none of us loved it, but I'm kind of really glad that the last movie in John Carpenter's career is one day <laughs> we all kind of liked. Now he can listen to the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> You guys don't know whether he listened or not. You just know. No, he told me, he DM'd me, and he said, fuck off. And really? Said, yeah. That he sounds said, I'm like watching him. my b-ball. Yeah. Did he really? No, he did not. That'd be okay. amazing. He did. <laughs> I would frame that and put it on my wall. <laughs> okay. He'd be like, there would be a portrait of it on my wall if he had. <laughs> Julia. Yes. It's been a while since we've had you on. I know you've only kind of caught snatches of John's last few movies, especially rightfully leaving vampires early. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts of that kind of later era of John's career? I mean, I can definitely say that I didn't miss it. <laughs> yeah, no, you didn't. <laughs> like, I would say, with the exception of The Ward, there really wasn't anything where I was like, oh, yeah, I'd watch that for pleasure. Like, there wasn't anything where I was like, oh, that, oh, you're watching that tonight? Oh, yeah, let's watch that together. Be like, have fun with that. Yeah. <laughs> Go watch YouTube videos. As I sit downstairs in the <laughs> darkness while my family has fun upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. You know that I'm not as much of a fan of the horror stuff right. as I am his other stuff. So it definitely has been very horror heavy for the past little while. Right, right. And like, not my jam. Yeah, no Zuma Beach in this stretch. I mean, would it hurt? You know, like... <laughs> I know. that I want to see John Carpenter do his Kid with a Talking Dog movie, you know? I want not? It would be the coolest <laughs> kid with a talking dog movie around. Mm -hmm. There's always room for more. Kurt Russell as Snake Dachshund. <laughs> I think maybe this would be a good time and just kind of overall final thoughts on the whole John Carpenter career retrospective. I mean, Julia, as our newcomer to John, yeah. what did you think about the overall career that we exposed you to? Not a fan. <laughs> <laughs> no, I am a fan, actually. I think um, Alex is talking about Big Trouble in Little China mm -hmm. and about how I was never a fan of Big Trouble in Little China. I can't say I watched it a lot of times, maybe twice, <laughs> before we did the podcast for it. And I'd never watched it with Alex. And I was just kind of like, yeah, this is a movie I don't like. Everyone. Why is that? I don't understand why you like that movie <laughs> so much. And we watched it again, and I, I still didn't understand why he liked it so much. But what I did see was the movie through his eyes and mm -hmm. how excited he was and how much he loved it. And it actually did teach me like a life lesson about taking the pleasure in something that necessarily doesn't float your boat. But because someone you love really likes it, you get the pleasure of their pleasure, if that makes <laughs> sense. Which was really nice. This gives happiness to the person who gives me happiness. Exactly. It's and that's true. really lovely. And I am a grumpy B-I-T-C-H, so that was a big one for me. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of opinions. <laughs> that was like an actual like thing. And that was quite nice. Thank you, John Carpenter, for that. You're welcome. <laughs> Is that what his voice sounds like? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> That sounds about right. Yeah. Better than the one we used to have Kevin do. <laughs> <laughs> and then I think that I was a little bit sad because, like, I don't want to say he didn't live up to his potential, but I do feel like there was a definite direction that he could have gone that I feel like he didn't explore. And that makes me a little bit sad because I think he could have been more of a... Um, is, like, auteur the right word? Or, like... He could have been an A-list filmmaker. An A-list filmmaker. I really think he could have been. He has fantastic scripts. He was Wonderful close. characters. He's really good at, like, getting performances out of actors. He's a writer, too. Came up with all those ideas mm -hmm. himself. Definitely, like, trailblazing as far as women characters. I just really think that something could have happened there. Mm -hmm. And, like, I mean, he had a huge career, and it was successful. So I don't want to be like, oh, well, you just made mm -hmm. these horror movies or whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, it's hard because it's like, yeah. just the fact that someone gets to make a movie in Hollywood is considered a success. Yeah, because absolutely. it's so difficult to do. And maintaining a career, like, over that period of time yeah. is so hard to do. So kudos to that. But mm -hmm. it does make me a little bit yeah. sad because I really think that something magical could have happened there and we could have gotten some really good gems mm -hmm. out of him, even more so than the stuff that he made. Because I did like his earlier stuff so much mm -hmm. more than the older stuff. Especially because right before his career took the turn into the low-budget horror, he was up to direct Thelma and Louise and Tombstone and yeah. like some major A-list pictures that were just kind of taken away from him. Where would his career have gone had he done those? And then he went back to genre work. That's a little sad. <laughs> 
a bit of a bummer. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but he still gets to be friends with Kurt Russell. He does. So he's still better than all of us. The Kurt won't still make movies with him. Julia, what were your favorites and least favorites? My favorites were They Live, mm. Assault on Precinct 13, mm. Prince of Darkness. Oh, yeah, you love Prince of Darkness. Zuma Beach, obviously. Mm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and Eyes of Laura Mars. Ooh. I'd say those are my favorites. And least favorites are his TV movies, El Diablo and that Elvis movie. <laughs> no fight back on that. Just a sad, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> El Diablo, I still think, could have been something had they made it under the conditions they were originally going to. But they had to chop it down to make it so cheaply. Yeah, I just found it definitely mm. like low. And Elvis, yeah. Yeah. Oh, and um, oh, of course, The Thing. Yeah, yes, the masterpiece. Yeah. The Thing. Oh, yeah, I would say They Live and The Thing are definitely like top two. Mm. Top two for sure. And uh, I did really like Prince of Darkness. Mm. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There's my list. You know, yeah. I learned to like Prince of Darkness. Yeah, I changed to a recommend for Prince of Darkness. Well, Alex, why don't we go ahead and shift to you? Just thoughts on John. Thoughts on John? A remarkably consistent director for... Uh, Two thirds. <laughs> a decade and a bit. <laughs> 13 years, maybe. He's done some of my favorite movies. I love his aesthetic. I love the music. I love the uh, font of the, <laughs> his, uh, the titles. I love the ideas. It was a man who had a lot of great ideas, had that independent spirit, truly a Western filmmaker at heart, who made a lot of great siege pictures or people trapped inside like a building pictures, and then started to come up with some really good ideas. And I think he shied away from either failure or success and turned away from what could have been a really interesting career that really built on things and then went back into horror and action and what he knew. And I think that was a real shame. I think he had more of a shot than Wes Craven, who Wes Craven got, unfortunately, he was more typecast. I think John Carpenter yeah. had uh, more room to move because he really couldn't pin him down as much. I think it's a real shame the way things went. And yeah, the 90s were not fun. <laughs> Favorite films? Well, if I'm to launch one film into space to send to another... Oh, I guess I shouldn't do this, because then it will scare them from coming to Earth. But it's got to be The Thing. That's, to me, his masterpiece. As for favorite, it might be Big Trouble Little China, which is just pure cinematic joy for me. But I still love Somebody's Watching Me was a really nice thriller. A lot of tension. I was very pleasantly surprised by that particular one. Genuine themes, too. Yeah. I still have affection for Zuma Beach. <laughs> they Live. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they Live was fantastic. I love They Live and its madcap views. And as for ones like Dislike, I don't think there's anything I really hate except for pro-life. And Vampires has really not aged <laughs> very well. James Woods is an asshole. Halloween 3? Halloween 3, you know, I don't hate Halloween 3. Silent Predators? I never, I don't think... Yeah, they weren't there for that one. That was just you yeah, and me. Yeah, I wasn't there for Silent Predators. <laughs> yeah. They didn't watch it after the fact, though? I, I will. You never went back and watched it? <laughs> I will. <laughs> no, I won't. <laughs> she won't. I will. <laughs> Good, she's smart. <laughs> well, now I won't. No, you have to watch it. It's the rule. to hoard that terrible information. <laughs> Fine, I'll watch Silent Predators. It's Snakes Invade a Small Town, or as I call it, Snakes on the Plains. Uh, <laughs> nice. That's probably more clever than the entire movie. <laughs> yes. It <laughs> actually, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's probably better. <laughs> I love John Carpenter. I think he's great. <laughs> It was interesting because even going into this, I knew kind of the overall swings, you know, right out of the gate in the 70s, did some really defining work that really influenced a lot of people. The 80s, he struggled but made some of his best, most incredible and memorable movies. And then from the 90s on, it's just been a not even a steady decline, but a uh, avalanche down the hill into a giant snowball mm -hmm. type of rapid decline. And he never quite, he, there's still stuff that he made that was good, but it never rose out of the hole that he fell in. Mm -hmm. But it was interesting to finally sit down and put everything in order and kind of like figure out this is when John stopped caring and that's when certain aspects stopped working, like his writing. He stopped caring about scripts. You know, this is when this wonderful team of collaborators that he built left and he's left mm -hmm. without them. 
you know, and he builds another team and they left. Mm. Just seeing John decline and become kind of more just bitter and cynical and kind of dismissive of things has not been that inspiring, but I at least went in knowing it was there. And it's been fascinating filling in the gaps and seeing all these weird ephemera that I haven't seen before. Like, Black Moon Rising was not very good, but it was interesting. Mm. Better late than never. John Carpenter writes a film about senior citizens escaping from a retirement home to steal Mm -hmm. a train. Who even thought that existed? It's true. And yet it was a wonderful, charming little mess of a movie. Zuma Beach. (laughs) How many John Carpenter fans have actually watched Zuma Beach? Not enough. <laughs> Three. I think just you guys. And have beheld that Suzanne Summer swimsuit. <sighs> beheld young Michael Bean and Timothy Hutton. It was a delightful romp. <laughs> it was indeed. <laughs> Good Lord, Rosanna Arquette's bikini. <laughs> it was fun. And Suzanne Summer's singing on the soundtrack was... happened. <laughs> <laughs> Seeing all the odd ephemeral, like I had never seen Eyes of Laura Mars, and that was like a really interesting, striking movie. And I just really enjoyed seeing this crew. It was just a kind of fascinating character study, even though it was a frustrating character study in the end. It was just an interesting character study of a creator who had a lot of talent right out of the gates, but struggled so hard that he kind of ultimately burned himself out. Mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, I mean, Wes, despite being typecast and stuck in a genre he never really wanted to be stuck in, still kept consistently working on a pretty consistent level. And like every decade he had like a big hit that kind of shook everything up. Yeah, he changed the horror genre like three times. And so what else do you want from him? Per decade. Did Wes Craven not want to make horror movies? He wanted to make romance dramas. Really? Yeah. Oh my God. He's a know. very intelligent, very... Very thoughtful man. Aww, that's so sad. Did you ever see Music of the Heart, the Meryl Streep film about the violin teacher? Mm, I know about it, but I haven't seen it. That's like his one movie that he got to make that wasn't a horror movie. I mean, it's interesting that John is from that same era that gave us like Toby Hooper and George Romero and Wes Craven. Whereas while Wes, Toby and George were kind of always just stuck in that genre, their careers you could look at are kind of like where John was in the 90s throughout their entire Mm -hmm. careers. There's peaks, there's moments where they come out, but John really broke into the big leagues there for a little while in the 80s. Like, Thing was a big-budget universal production. It's true. Starman was an A-list picture. It was an Oscar-nominated A-list picture. None of the other filmmakers got to do anything on the level of Starman. Elvis, for all of its tackiness, was a pretty large-scale production at the time and a very successful one at the time. John managed to break out into the A-list leagues, and then it just kind of fell apart, and he was just kind of stuck wandering back into the dregs. And that's where it's sad. The world wasn't ready for him. Yeah. And for a guy who always wanted to make a Western, he never made a Western. He made like a couple Western-ish movies, but Mm -hmm. he never made a full-on Western. It's um, really depressing. Yeah. Yeah. Let's spice it up a bit. (laughs) Well, and then, yeah, my favorites, God, it's hard for me to pick. I mean, I love Big Trouble in Little China, but I also love you know, Halloween, The Thing, Starman is incredible. For this project was the first time I had seen someone's watching me. I still think that's one of his most important and striking and well put together movies. And I think more people need to see it than have. Even just the fact that it touches on very deep feminist themes and themes about male privilege and stalking and all stuff that are incredibly relevant to this day. And even the word. The word was a great surprise to just kind of end on a decent note. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And ones that I don't like, oh, God, where to start? I mean, yeah, Vampires was just dreck. Yeah, I know you love Escape from L.A., and I have to apologize for how that episode went out because of the political climate. We should have maybe reined that in a bit more. That's okay. And love is a strong word. (laughs) I did not enjoy Escape from L.A. Elvis, he directed the hell out of a horrible script. I don't hate Memoirs of an Invisible Man, but oh, does it not work? And yeah, you you both weren't here for Silent Predators. That was just, oh. And boy, and then Alex, we can certainly get into the Halloween sequels. Oh, yeah. John, it's a career. It's definitely been an interesting career full of its ups and downs. And, you know, even the 90s had In the Mouth of Madness, which is to this day held up as one of the best examples of Lovecraft on cinema. Rightfully so. It does entirely work for me, but it worked more than well enough. And Gas Station. Seriously, Mm -hmm. that segment of Body Bags. Oh, yeah, that was good. Mm. That was good. Yeah. Entirety of Body Bags. Eh. Gas Station. Yes. (laughs) It's been an interesting journey. And Zuma Beach, right? 
Yes. Of course. Yeah. I liked Better Late Than Never more than Zuma Beach. Granted, it had Donald Pleasance doing jazz hands to disco music, so mm. I can't not. Yeah. You know, and then, God, there's, I even mentioned, like, Escape from New York, and they live. It's just Assault of Precinct 13, Dark Star. You know, it's just what a career full of not one or two hits, but, like, a good third of his movies are classics. Oh, yeah. A good third of his movies, even if you don't love them, you, you have to admit, man, have they had an impact and have really stuck with people. How many directors have, like, one standout movie versus a guy who a third of his output of, like, 30 films... Ten of them are classics. That's a career to applaud. And, you know, people love The Fog. I don't love The Fog, but that's been an important one to a lot of people. I like The Fog and I'll fight anyone. (laughs) I like Christine. Nobody else as much as me. I'm glad we took this trip. Indeed. It's been a ride. And Alex, I'm glad you did it with me. Yeah. And Julie, I know life got in the way of doing the rest of it, but... I keep having babies! (laughs) I know, but I'm so glad that we had you for as long as we did. And to be fair... The part that you missed out was the part that was worth missing out. Yeah, that's true. I think I'm the smartest. <laughs> I had yeah. that baby and I was like, you can joy, guys. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God, especially Pearl Life was one of the worst things we watched in this project. It was truly, truly terrible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you missed nothing. <laughs> Wonderful. And so, Evie. What's up? So for having not been with us on this journey, what did you think of this journey? I think you all went on it very well. (laughs) So John Carpenter, I'm really glad we did this show. I'm really glad we took the time for it. John Carpenter, a life. Again, I'm still going to be doing stuff. Right. We still have the John Carpenter comics and the unproduced projects. and At some point, another Halloween movie will emerge, even if it's not the one that they're working on now. It's true. This is not like the flat-out end of Masters of Carpentry. John is still around. (laughs) He signed a deal to direct four pilots for a production studio, but that was a while ago. I don't know if that's going to happen. Every now and then they talk about doing something else. I don't know. There's his albums. Probably not going to do an episode on the albums because how do you review albums? Certain people know how to. I don't. I can't either. I love music and I couldn't. It sounds good. They're wonderful to listen to. I was actually just listening to uh, Lost Themes earlier today. Good stuff. John Carpenter's story is not yet done. Nope. So far. And apparently he's actually quit smoking, so he might still go on for a while. There you go. And this will be finally the public announcement. I am going to be starting another podcast series about another director's career. Is it Tyler Perry? No. Is it Tyler Perry? No, (laughs) it's not Tyler Perry. That would go on for years. (laughs) Sorry, I got excited. Carry on. Angie Tusa, who guested with us on the In the Mouth of Madness and Village of the Damned episodes, she and I are going to be doing Shumacast a podcast exploring the film career of Joel Schumacher. (laughs) Godspeed. Amazing. See you on Tigerland. Sorry, what's the name of the podcast again, Noel? Schumacast. No, that's cute. (laughs) It was our placeholder name, and we couldn't think of anything better. I can't think of anything better. It's great. I have several other directors I might want to do shows of down the road, but I kind of like this whole idea of a finite podcast exploring a person's career from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. Seeing that story of their life and their career. John's did not end on the happiest of notes. I mean, he's still around. He's still making stuff. Still seems happy. Especially now he's working with his son. That's a really cool thing. But I will flat out say he never lived up to the potential that he had. I think he did. I think he made the thing. I think he made some great films. I think he's making some awesome music and he loves his family. So two thumbs up to the life of John Carpenter for me. (laughs) But I think he had the potential to keep making great films. But he left a far bigger mark than a lot of directors do. He did. Even some people go and they make their Oscar-nominated film, then they kind of just disappear and that's all you ever hear of them. Mm Mm-hmm. Who directed Chariots of Fire? I'm trying to remember. Some guy? Um, yeah. John Carpenter. <laughs> oh, look it up right now. <laughs> Gotta imagine his version of that theme. Hugh Hudson. Some guy named Hugh Hudson directed Hugh it. Hugh Hudson Hawk. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, there are so many Oscar nominated directors that you look at their career 10 years later and it's like, where did you come from? Where did you go? Where did you go? Cotton Eye Joe. Where did Joe. you come from, Cotton Eye Joe? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, do you know what else he did? What? He did that Kim Basinger movie, I Dreamed of Africa. Ah. Uh, yep. That guy has an Oscar. And- <laughs> <laughs> what I mean is like, John, even if his films were not successful when they first came out, when they hit video, when they hit TV, they just built such a following and became such hugely influential sensations. And it's just amazing... Even though, yeah, things took a major downswing, Mm. 
the amount of amazing movies this guy put out in such a short span of time. His influence is still being felt today. There's plenty of new artists, musical and filmical. <laughs> I mean, Assault on Precinct 13 was 1976. They Live was 1988. Between those 12 years, he made Halloween, The Fog, Escape from New York, The Thing, Starman, Christine, that run of amazing movies. Any director would just die for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it's like you can't say his career was a failure. And again, he ended on the word, which a lot of people look down on. But hey, it was a pretty good movie. And it was still John doing the stuff John does. And the word makes me want to see him do another movie. Yeah, I'd totally be down for another one. Julia, would you be down for another John movie if you made one? Yeah, I would watch it for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, uh, hmm. You'd have to see what it was about. I'd yeah. Be like, yeah, I'd be a little bit wary of subject matter just because he's dealt with some stuff that I'm not crazy about watching. But, I mean, as long as it's cool on that front, I would definitely check it out. I would definitely check out anything that he made moving forward, for sure. Evie, would you listen to us talk about and potentially guest on if John made <laughs> Yes. God, yes. John, you, I don't think he burned our bridges. You know, yeah, he kind of let us down a bit. But we're still for John. We still want more John. Again, I love the music that he's out there making now with him and his son. Mm -hmm. I love those albums. I love that he's kind of making a career cameoing in music videos. I love that there's this whole resurgence of comic books that he's been supervising and, and running. You know, even if he's not making movies, he's still out there making stuff. Indeed. So, yeah. Anything else anyone wants to add? Still like the fog. Again, this is Masters of Carpentry signing off. From nine, nine, nine. Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklocke.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. I'm thinking about that Frozen movie and how much I liked it. It was mostly so wolves. <laughs> it was so good, you guys. It's so good. Yeah. Frozen? Like Disney's Frozen? No, it was a different... Fr they get stuck on a ski lift. Oh, I meant to watch that. <laughs> They're so stupid. Oh, my God. It's by the guy who did the Hatchet movies. Oh, I have so much those. anger about it. <laughs> this is the downside of, like, having gone skiing and living near a mountain is I'm just like, they would not know. That wouldn't happen. <laughs> That's wrong. <laughs> yes, I know it's a movie. I can't suspend my disbelief. <laughs> well, they weren't thinking. They had brain freeze. <laughs> that was worth it eyes of laura mars and elements of halloween i think this is the closest carpenters come to making a giallo movie i don't know if i'm familiar with giallo so i will take your word for it <laughs> evie <laughs> We can just take a moment to listen. It's so cute. <laughs> it's cute, but she'll go for hours. She'll talk to anyone, too. She'll have a full conversation. She'll just ask any, like, repair person, anyone on the street, questions. <laughs> she'll interrupt anything. Like, oh, I could be deep in conversation with Julia, and she'll just be like, so anyways, this is what I think about Hello Kitty. <laughs> <laughs> she needs to come on and tell me all of her thoughts on Hello Kitty, because I'm very <laughs> interested. I'm, like, super interested. I can do that. <laughs> I can definitely do that. Hold on. Actually, I'm going to do that since it's our last episode. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about Hello Kitty? I like her sister. Her sisters? Yeah. yeah, what do you like about her sisters? I love her bow, and I, I love their bows. Mm hmm Because they all have different color bows. Yeah, and I like their dress, too. Yeah, they're pretty great. Yeah. Well, thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> that was the cutest thing in the world. <laughs> that is going to be the now. end of this episode. So. <laughs> That's it. Goodbye. That's it. That's how you end it with that. That's so cute. Oh, my God.